have been uh, trying to get our technical issues worked out, but we're settling, so. <laughs> um, it's so good to see you here at the park. Um, I know it's a little windy, but it's, it's sunny too, so it's nice. Um, it's always nice to get to see kind of a different group. There's, there's a just people, more people that are um, comfortable coming outside or that want to be out. So we're just really glad that you're here. Um, we do have today the opportunity to introduce to y'all a new church member, someone that joined our church in the last couple of weeks. And she's actually here. So um, Sandy Hemmingson, wave. She's, oh, she's back there. And she's a new church member. Mm -hmm. We're so glad that she she uh, popped in the church a couple weeks ago and just plugged right in. And uh, last night at the um, we had a father daughter um, gala, and she was in the kitchen serving. So she has just jumped in and is is uh, ready to go. And we're just so glad that she that she is a part of our church. Um, we have a lot coming up this this week. Uh, this week is this week, and then the next week is actually Easter week y'all so um there's several things that are that we're doing as a church that week and uh if you have any questions about them you can i'd love to tell you more but um i'll just tell you we're doing a special prayer experience at the church uh on during easter week where you can come up um and do kind of your own individual walk through this um prayer experience it'll be really meaningful and we'd love for you to do that we're gonna have a good friday uh service on friday evening at the worship center at the church um saturday april the third we're sponsoring along with the kiwanis club and the hideaway club a big easter egg hunt right here at frontier park on saturday afternoon it's going to be so much fun and so tell all the kiddos that you know about that um, and then Easter Sunday, of course, we're going to have worship here, but we're going to do it at 10 a.m. on Easter. Okay, so just for that one day, we're going to have worship at 10. That's the only service we're going to have on Easter. And so everyone um, from our church and community and whoever wants to come can come out. And then you'll still have plenty of time to go meet up with family or friends or have a big lunch or whatever after we finish that service. So, um we're excited about being able to do all that, and we'd love for you to be a part. On Easter, when we meet here, well, we'll meet here again next Sunday, just like this at 11. Then on Easter, when we meet, actually, we're going to get to have our church choir, and we're so excited about them starting back uh, to play, uh, to sing on Easter. If anybody wants to join up with them for Easter choir, Mark would love that. They love to have some extras. Um, they maybe don't want to do choir full time all year, but you would want to jump in. And they're having practice on Wednesday from six to seven this week and the next week. And that's all you have to do. And then you can, and then you yeah. can sing, right? You bet. You bet. It'll be. He's not on. Um, so, anyways, I think that's all that I have to tell you. Uh, we're so glad that you're here. We have, um, we do have our uh, sprinkler can. Um, for anyone who is used to giving in the church building on Sunday morning, if you want to give an offering that way. Um, we have song sheets if you don't have one of those. We have some hand sanitizer if you need to use that. And uh, we're just glad you're here. Mm -hmm. I think that's all. We would love for you to come and sing. If you, if you uh, enjoy singing and sung in choir, or even if you don't have experience with that, um, we've got two weeks that we can put together a piece for Sunday and people are really, uh, they've really been missing it. And I'm, I'm working real hard on John Frank, but he does come out on Wednesday nights, the kids, during that time. So we're going to maybe figure something else out. How, uh, is anybody cold? We're going to start by auctioning off my jacket. Seriously, if somebody's cold, I would love for you to wear my jacket. Um, I, I bathe at least once a week, whether I need it or not. And you're welcome to, to uh, come up and use my jacket or um, stay warm. So uh, it, was, it was so nice about an hour ago out here, and then the wind picked up. And so uh, let's just think of the wind as being the Holy Spirit blowing through us as we worship. Why don't we, uh, if you want to, um, if you're comfortable standing, stand. If not, you can sit either way. But um, let's, let's get our lungs going, and it'll help warm us up a little bit. And let me just lead us in prayer now as we start. 
Lord, thank you so much for the beauty of being able to be outside. Um, I think we take for granted uh, that we have this park and the willingness of the community, hideaway community here to uh, allow us to meet here in this beautiful, beautiful setting. And I thank you for the people that have come this morning and just pray that you would let this be a, a really special uh, time, a community time for us together. And uh, we welcome you right now. We need you. We seek you. I pray, Lord, you'll remind us that you are, are uh, right here with us. You are in us. You are around us. You hold us up. You support us. You, you're our foundation. You hedge us in on all sides and remind us of that. Let our strength be encouraged and um, strengthened today as we gather together to worship you. And we do welcome you. Have your way with us. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Ladies, come on up. Where are you? My, my, my coat is playing the low notes of my, of my keyboard. Does anybody want my coat? Seriously. Anybody cold? No? Your daughter's going. All right. There you go. Thanks. Okay. Let's worship together. Oh, Lord, my God.
out, each of us individually together, just, just worshiping God and thinking about Him. Let's sing it again. Splendor of some people this morning. It's your first time to be here. And we're so grateful that you can. I, today, uh, today, if you're in the sun, those are the high dollar seats, so you have to tithe more. If you got a, sun, a seat in the sun, no, I'm just kidding. You know, a couple of weeks from now, it might, who knows, it might be in the 90s and the high dollar seats will be up here in the shade. 
Or, you know, it doesn't matter how cold it gets, John Frank wants to shave with his shorts on and his flip-flops. So it doesn't matter what the temperature is. And for those of you that have guessed with us, he's easy to pick out. He's the one up here in the shade with the short sleeves, the shorts, and the flip-flops. Um, if you are uh, a first-time guest or you haven't been here, uh, you, you, this is the first time back since we've been in the park. This is the first Sunday back. And I'm going to contend with the fan, obviously, the whole time I'm up here. But uh, we're in a series uh, where we're talking about disciplines. And it's uh, we understand discipline. We, we understand it mostly in the vein of uh, what we have experienced in our life in the sense of uh, we want to lose some weight so we're a little bit more disciplined about what we eat. We want to get healthier so we're a little bit more disciplined about uh, our uh, exercising. We want to uh, make, if you're a student in the room, you want to make better grades so you get a little bit more disciplined about your studies. Uh, and you know, the list goes on and on. And for all of us in different seasons of our life, we've probably experienced some sort of doing discipline like that. And that's what we're accustomed to. That's what we're, uh, we're used to. And that's great. Uh, but in the, in the vein of what we've been talking about, scripture teaches and talks about disciplines in such a way as it, but it's a relational discipline. Uh, it's a relational dis discipline. It's disciplines in order for us uh, to experience a more intimate relationship with God, a more intimate relationship with Christ. And Scripture speaks uh, greatly about those things. Uh, Gavin, say thank you. Barb got you a chair so you don't sit on that cold concrete with your shorts on. Uh, it's, it's the discipline in the vein of, listen, uh, James chapter 4, verse 8. Here's a verse I think you've either heard or you know, or maybe you have it memorized. And, and it says this. It says, uh, draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. Or come near to me and I'll come near to you. Okay, and that's uh, from the relationship with our Holy Father, with Jesus Christ. It, it's, it's talking about, hey, if you, if you draw near to me, I'm going to draw near to you. In reality, because I'm already there. And it's not like I have to go very far to get to you. I'm already there. And if you read in that portion of James, it's, he's talking about relationships. Okay? And he's saying that, hey, you've been paying attention to a lot of other relationships in your life. I want you to pay close attention to me and watch me work in your life. And so that's the vein in which we talk about disciplines. Are we... We talked about simplicity. That's what we talked about first. And we talked about it, it is a disciplined thing for us to simplify our lives because our lives are hectic and busy. And we, we normally are adding to. Now, how many people can have your testimony as the normal scope of life for you as you're always adding to? Come on, raise your hand because you're lying if you don't. You're... you're Things are always being added to your life. There's not a whole lot being deleted. And things get added without you being disciplined to add them, right? They just get added all the time. Things, how many people have had things added to their calendar you wish weren't added to your calendar, but they're there. They're on your schedule, okay? And you didn't have to be disciplined to add them. What it takes discipline is when you have to take something off for something else. Okay, so we talked about simplicity. We talked about silence. Uh, we live in a very noisy world. I mean, I don't have to speak a lot into that. We live in a very noisy world, not just, not just with our ears, but we live visually with a noisy world. Everywhere you go, there's visual distractions. You're driving down the road. You know, marketers have learned that we'll just bombard your eyes with billboards to make you think about all the things that we want and we're telling you you need more of. And we, we, so, you know, yeah, we need some silence, some real silence in our, not just in our ears, but in our hearts so that we can experience God the way he wants us to experience him. And today we're talking about, we're talking about solitude. And uh, so I would ask you this in thinking about that, you know, what are your thoughts, your feelings? What is even your experiences uh, with the concept of solitude? And why do we need to talk about that in a, an intentional way? And that's the buzzword here is because 
when it comes to any discipline, it takes some intentionality on our part. We have to be intentional about it. Um, so I, I would ask you as we start, just to think about something. And, and go ahead and raise your hand because it makes me feel like you're listening, you're involved. How many, how many of you, whether you're, in, you're out here today and you're retired or whether you're still working or, or maybe you, you stay at home or you're a student or whatever, how many of you right now can raise your hand and say there is something scheduled for me this week? There is something on my calendar scheduled this week. Okay? It should be almost everybody. Something is on a calendar somewhere, whether you have it written on a calendar or whatever, scheduled for your, for your time this week. Now, the, what I would like to ask you this, for the thing or things that are scheduled on that calendar, if it wasn't scheduled, if it wasn't on the calendar, if it wasn't scheduled, what is the likelihood of it actually happening? Are you making that appointment? Or um, I'll give it to you this way. You, if you need to go to the doctor, you make an appointment with the doctor at a specific day, on a specific day, at a specific time. If the, do if the doctor just had an open door policy, there's a lot of you that just wouldn't go. You think you would. You think, yeah, I, I'm feeling bad. I'll make time to go to the doctor. It's an open door policy, and you still wouldn't. But when you put it on a calendar, on a specific day, at a specific time, you do it. And so there's some intentionality there. And uh, so I, don't, I want you to understand that this is intentional, whether or not you're out here, whether you're an introvert or an extrovert. Because when we start talking about spending time alone, when we start talking about solitude, all the introverts, all of us can go, yeah, I got this. I got this. You know, that's something I, I love to do anyway. I don't have to have a whole lot of discipline to do that. I don't really like people anyway. So, <laughs> some of you are like, I don't know. I'd rather not be around people. Okay? And so, but I want you to understand that even for the introverts, the discipline of sol solitude has to be intentional. Because it's not just about being alone. Some people spend way too much time alone, but there's no purpose in their aloneness. Okay? It's the intentionality of our relationship uh, with God, our, our, our intimacy with God. And so I also don't have to tell you this, but I'm going to go ahead and speak it out loud just so we can kind of be on the same page. There is nothing in our culture in 2021 that is helpful for us to pay attention to God. Do you kind of know that? There is nothing in our world or our society that is trying to help you pay attention to God. There's nothing out there that you're going to come across. You're being constantly bombarded before you wake up and after you go to sleep. Now, I'm, I, want, I said that that way for a reason. You're being constantly bombarded with noise, uh, anxiety, and all these voices that are coming after your time and your life before you wake up. And that's why many that are listening right now have experienced, at least at some point in your life, and some of you maybe all the time, where before that alarm you set goes off, you're already awake, laying in your bed, and there's this constant list going on of all the things you got to get accomplished. And so it woke you up. And so you're being bombarded even before you hit the floor. And then there's also people that you know when you lay yourself down to go to bed at night that some of us have trouble even falling asleep because of the same voices and the same noise. All the things that those voices are saying we should have got accomplished, we didn't. All those things that, that saying we should have done it a different way or we should, we, we need to get this done and we're not doing it. And it even affects our sleep. And that's why we have a, a restless, restless society. And uh, when it comes to solitude, I want us to look at this and, and your relationship with God. Because that's what it's all about. It's not just simply 
uh, being alone. Anybody can do that. It's understanding this. When, when it, we got to understand that Scripture teaches us uh, to relate to God as a person. Now, not every religion does that, okay? That's, a, that's kind of a, a Christianity thing. Other religions think they, they, they talk about God as being a figure up that they can't, they can't relate to. Um, um, is they think of that, that God as a concept or an ideology. Uh, Christianity, God is, is the person of God, the person of the Father, or in the Trinity, the person of the Father, the person of the Son, the person of the Holy Spirit. But the reason why that's so important is because it's through real relationships that we learn how to relate to God as well. And here's the deal we know about giving God our attention. It's no different. It's no different than any of the relationships we have right here, right now. Whether it's with your spouse or your child or a friend. What they want and the way you show someone that you love them is by paying attention to them. Giving them your attention. Okay? It is, if you just say the words but you never give them any attention, they're, gonna, they're not going to believe very much that you love them. Okay? And you, you know this if you're a parent and parent out here. I want to walk away from this mic so bad. Um, if you're a parent out here, maybe you experienced this. I know I did with all three of my children. When you're with your child, when they're little, and maybe they're sitting in your lap or near you, and they're trying to have your attention, and you're distracted, and that child reaches and grabs you by the face, and they pull their face and point it right towards you. Any parent in here ever experienced that with their children? Yeah. What are they saying to you? They're saying, hey, mom, hey, dad, I want your attention. I want you to come near to me. Okay? I want to know that, that you and I are on the same page. That's what they're saying with their little hands. And, and so the person of God wants our attention. He created us. He wants our attention. And so it would... And, and that's one of the ways, it's not the only way that you show God you love him is by giving your attention. So I would ask you, and just like I asked myself, are you paying attention to God? Are you paying any attention to God? And, and, and one of the ways you do that is through the solitude, I mean, through the discipline of solitude, that carving out time for him in the schedule that you have, which for some people that's just like crazy busy and some of you might be sitting here and you're retired and you do have extra time but you fill it with a bunch of other things uh, there is some hiccups to solitude that we face okay and I'm going to kind of describe some of them and why why there's uh, some things that kind of push us away from solitude uh, one is um, the thought of losing control okay if I if I give time in solitude, if I carve out for God some time away from everything else, I might miss something, okay? I might miss some activity that everybody else is involved in or this right here, okay? I'm, I'm just going to say this. I'm not a phone hater. I have one, okay? And so I would venture to say there's probably not a single person out here that doesn't have one with them right now. And the reason why you have one with you right now is we've become an acclimated society that we never do anything without it, ever. It's always near us, always usually within arm's reach of us at all times. Most of us sleep with it right beside our bed, okay? And therefore, it has acclimated us to a society that never has to miss anything and we fear if we're not around it, we will. We'll miss someone trying to get a hold of us. We'll miss that text. We get, most of us have been acclimated to the point where we get all of our information from this. Most, most people, especially any millennials out here, you don't ever sit in front of a TV and watch the news. If you get any news, it's right here. And, and we fear letting go of this. We fear uh, carving out time even away from this, even if it was just 10 minutes, because the fear is that we would miss something. 
And if we miss something, we're no longer in control. So there's a fear of losing control. And then the, the, the other the, the hiccup with solitude is this. And for any of us out here, which I'd venture to say, most of us have spent a little time alone at some point. And what happens is, is uh, all these thoughts begin to come into our mind. We've all been there, whether we want to admit it or not. We get alone and we get quiet and everything stops bombarding our, everything starts bombarding our brain. This thought comes in, this thought comes in, this thought comes in. And some of those thoughts uh, lead to a couple of other things that hinder solitude. Some of those thoughts are condemnation, right? You start feeling guilty about something. All of a sudden your past starts like replaying over uh Something that you did last night or last week or last year or 30 years ago. And it starts replaying over in your head in that moment of quietness and solitude. So what does it do to us? It makes us want to run from it. We want to run from solitude instead of running into it. We want to run away from it because here's the deal. Just like any discipline you would ever involve yourself into uh there it has a learning curve right and i want it so this is this is the way i want to encourage you not only to carve out time make space create margin for some solitude with god in your life but i want to encourage you to not quit because that's what you're going to want to do when those thoughts start coming in and you feel like you can't control them when you can't find that quietness in your head, when that guilt comes in, when that condemnation, there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus, so don't ever make the mistake that Christ is condemning you, because he's not, because there's no condemnation in Christ. There is some examining going on, because that's exactly what scripture does, to examine our souls. But solitude has a, a learning curve. It's a practice we embody just like anything that's worth doing, our first efforts will be pain. We'll be full of pain. When we do that, it's just kind of like this. If anybody out here decides that I want to run a marathon or even a 5K and you're not a runner, if tomorrow is your first day of running, how exciting and how enjoyable will it be? It won't be. It has a learning curve. I mean, my first day out, I want to make sure I can just run to the end of the street, right? Much less run all 5K or all the 26.2 miles of a marathon. That's not going to happen. There's a learning curve, and it'll be full of pain at, at the beginning. Just like, and here's the pain of spending time alone in solitude when it's not a practice in your life. There'll be this longing that you'll have. There'll be this longing for that to-do list. There'll be this, that longing to get back where the information and everything else under the sun is. There'll be this longing. Uh, There'll be this, this um, desire in us to get back to the activity. Because some of us, listen, some of us are just addicted to activity. We can't sit still. We've got to have activity going all the time. So if we practice, though, solitude, if we practice solitude, it would be kind of like this. If you were to practice and begin to play an instrument, say the violin, which I don't know how to play, and most likely never will. When I first start to practice the violin, it doesn't sound very good, does it? It would sound terrible. And it wouldn't sound like very beautiful music. But the practice in itself wouldn't be bad because I would still be accomplishing something towards what I want. And so here's the deal. Solitude with some regularity, it can become rich. And we can discover space in our hearts in a world where God meets us. And that's what he wants. He wants to meet us there. And that's what James chapter 4 says. He wants to meet us. Now, uh, we've, got, we've got a great um, 
We've got a great role model in Scripture to help us learn why this is important. Solitude, can, it can become a place where we have nothing to prove and no one to impress. And it can become that transform, transforming uh, work in our souls if we allow ourselves to carve out time. Now, we have a great example, and I have some of these written down. In Mark chapter 1, in Mark chapter 1, it says this in the gospel. And it says this over and over in the gospel. And I want you to understand that. And we, we're not going to read every occurrence. But in Mark chapter 1, I want you to, I want you to oh, there we go. There, there goes one page. Mark chapter 1 uh, is uh, Mark's biography of Jesus' life. And he starts unlike the other gospels. He, does, he doesn't start with the birth of Jesus. He starts when he's already an adult. He starts with Jesus' baptism. And then this is what it says in verse 35. It says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. And I want to also read the verse after it because it's very important to life. And then it says, Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. And that's real life. And it's it's. Jesus understood that he needed to get away from the busyness of what was going on around him in ministry where he was constantly being bombarded with people and he constantly had at least the disciples around him all the time. He understood the importance of getting away and spending some time alone with his heavenly father so he could hear, so he could listen uh, to his father. And he spent time alone at least six different ways that I think speaks volumes. Every time he was faced with a major task, like in Luke chapter 4, Jesus went away. Every time he needed to recharge from hard work where he had been doing ministry, healing people, people always around him, Scripture tells us in Mark chapter 6 that he went away. He went away to a solitary place. It even tells us in Matthew chapter 14 when Jesus was grieving, when they beheaded his friend and his cousin, John the Baptist, it says he went away to a solitary place. When Jesus was about to make an important decision, it says he went away to a solitary place. It says that in Luke chapter 6. Wow. When Jesus, listen, when Jesus was about to face agony like never before in the garden of Gethsemane, I mean, before he went to the cross, it says he went away and he spent time alone. He spent time in solitude. He spent time with his heavenly father so that he would know exactly what he was supposed to do. And I'm sorry, I'm having to use both hands here. <laughs> Uh, to keep this from going away. So here's the deal. There's, there's no uh, prescribed uh, commandment in the Bible that says thou shalt go away to a solitary place and then this will happen. But there's very, very much what's mentored for us in the life, to life of Jesus in Scripture is that he, being the very nature of God, when he was doing his earthly ministry and living just like you and I, and he was faced with uh, being bombarded in every way with people all around him all the time, he chose to make space. He chose to create margin. He chose to, car chose to carve out specific time away from it all for his relationship with his heavenly father. And, and, and so it speaks volumes into our lives about the importance of that. And so what I want to do here, I want to, I want to ask you to do something, okay? And I don't normally do this, but I want to ask you to do something as we close. And uh, 
Mark will come up here and we're going to worship. But listen, I'm asking everybody here to do something today. I think this is so important for our relationship with God, whether you're a teenager or whether you're a retired adult. Is I'm going to ask you before you leave this park, before we even finish, to pick a day and to pick a time. And I'm not asking you to break out your calendar or whatever, but in your head, in your mind, nobody's going to know if you did or not, to pick a day, to pick a time, and give it a try. And I'm not saying for any prescribed amount of time. It could be 10 minutes. But start somewhere. Because if you don't, listen, the reason I'm saying before you leave here, if you don't pick a time and you don't pick a day, it'll be just like anything else in our life that doesn't get counted. We think it'll happen. We might even want it to happen. But it won't. Other things will get in the way. That's the kind of lifestyles we live anyway. Other things get in the way all the time of what we really want to do because we don't schedule it. We don't carve out time. We don't make space. We don't create margin. I want to read you some, some quotes from some people. Some of them you'll know. Some of them you, them you won't. And it's about this issue of solitude. Some of them wrote this hundreds of years ago in a whole different era. But yet they were still facing the same things we face in a hectic world like 2021. C.S. Lewis, we live in fact in a world starved for solitude, silence and private, and therefore starved for re uh, meditation and true friendship. Robert Lake, solitude, silence, and the straight keeping of the heart are the foundations and grounds of the spiritual life. Henry Newman, solitude is the furnace of transformation. Without solitude, we remain victims of our society and continue to be entangled in the illusions of the false self. The great pastor from many years go by, Charles Spurgeon. Listen to what Charles Spurgeon wrote in his journal. There are times when solitude is better than society and silence is wiser than speech. We should, be, we should be better Christians if we were more alone, waiting upon God and gathering through med meditation on His Word, spiritual strength for labor in His service. We ought to muse upon the things of God because this is where we get the real nourishment. This is where we get the real nourishment. Paul Tillich, language has created the word loneliness to express the pain of being alone but it's also created the word solitude to express the glory of being alone. Henry Newman again, without solitude, it is virtually impossible to live a spiritual life. We do not take the spiritual life seriously if we do not set aside some time to be with God and listen to Him. Basil Pennington, God is infinitely patient. I love this. He will not push himself into our lives. He knows the greatest thing he has given us is our freedom. If we want habitually, even exclusively, to operate from the level of our own reason, he will respectively keep silent. We can fill ourselves with our own thoughts, our own ideas, our own images, and our own feelings. He will not interfere. But if we invite him with attention, opening the inner spaces with silence, he will speak to our souls, not in words or concepts, but in the mysterious way that love expresses itself by his pure presence. Would you invite him? Would you come near to him, as James says? You got to carve out time for that. When you need to go to the doctor, you make an appointment. If you're a golfer, you make a tea time. Why do we not think that way about the, the relationship that matters the most in our life? Our relationship with God. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much.
that you desire time with us in a far greater measure than we'll ever desire time with you. But God, just like we practice disciplines for other areas of our life, help us to understand that we can practice practice a discipline. And though it will, it will have a learning curve, and though we'll be bombarded with the, the hectic uh, day-to-day -day operations of our life, God, if we just stay there with you, the promises in James is that you're going to draw near to us. God, that you will draw near, that your presence will be near, and we'll know it. And God, the reward is, is you. The reward is not like other disciplines where we'll be skinnier or healthier. The reward is you and your glory. God, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we sing, let me give you a minute to just think through the week that's ahead uh, so that you have a chance to do what uh, Lewis just encouraged us to do. Now, and uh, think about a time when you actually will be able to turn the phone off and just completely be disconnected from any distractions and where you can take some time. So let me give you a minute to do that.
Y'all have a great week. It's a wonderful time to be together. Have a wonderful week. Say hi to somebody if you uh, look around and you see people you don't know. Say hi to them maybe uh, uh, as you leave. And I want my coat back. <laughs> All right. We'll see you here next week.